intention of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Please be seated. We see too often today of people saying they believe one thing and doing another. Have you noticed that? Especially in election years, right? The notorious politicians are notorious for saying one thing and doing something completely different. I, I, Read my lips. I won't raise taxes. I mean, I, I hate to do that to, to Bush the greater, but it, it is what it is. It's, it's part of, and then what happened? They had to raise taxes. So sometimes we see this and we get too, too uh, familiar with it. I find as a counselor sometimes with uh, veterans is it's a different standard. When I talk to the brides, because there's so much of the world, that, and, and in the military we're kept to a standard that what you say is what you are. But the wives come from a different standard. Well, he's had nightmares every night, and then the reality is it's been every other night. But she's saying that because that's what the world wants to hear. The world wants to hear every night, so they'll pay more attention to that person. It's unfortunate. It's a twisting of the truth in, in, in many ways. Or how about... We, we see on New Year's Eve, we all make this New Year's resolution, right? We're going to do the following things. How long does that last? By the Feast of Epiphany, most people are back off their diets. And, and, and companies love this that sell any gadget that they say are going to rip your abs and, and make you muscular and stuff like that. You see these ads start up right around Christmas time, don't you? They get everybody ready for those, those uh, uh, resolutions. Or Nicodur. Yes, ma'am. I know, isn't it beautiful? You'll, you'll see Nicodur commercials or, or any kind of, you know, people are going to quit smoking. And they, they, they'll start heavy right, right before Christmas time. Because they know that, oh, yeah, I'm going to quit smoking this year. Or I'm going to quit that. Or I'm going to do this. It's always these things. And, and half of these machines that they sell for, for exercises, they'll do anything at all. You know, and they'll even use stuff like, oh, the Navy SEAL invented this. Oh, I want to be buff like a Navy SEAL. You couldn't handle to be a buff like a Navy SEAL. There's a lot of work that went into that other than a, a little wheel with a pin that the guy rides back and forth to make his, his guns. So we become sometimes morally numb of, of what the truth is. Have you noticed that? I mean, we just sort of look at the commercials like, oh yeah, whatever. But if you look at the commercials that they put on for different shows, there's an intentionality about that. They know the demographics of who watching it. Every time you hit with TiVo, oh, I'm going to record this. Well, they already know how old you are, the demographics of the house, because they got that from the cable company or whoever it's going. And, and so they say, okay, well, Men that are from the ages of 50 to 70 are going to watch Modern Marvels during the day because they ain't got a job. So I'm going to put my Viagra commercials on there. You're never going to see a feminine product during these, these shows. But during soap operas, what do they always do? Who used, to, who used to promote these things? Tide, Cascade, you know, it's all women things. Because they know guys aren't going to sit there and watch a day's whole lives or... General Hospital, unless you had a wife that mandated that you watched it with her. So <laughs> we've become numb of sorts. And this is swept across the nation where, where the belief and the practice don't seem to come together. Have you noticed that? The belief and the practice don't seem to come together. And this is sad. Because this has become so evident in, in this past summer as, I pull, as we pull apart the study of James, you're going to see, you're going to look at yourself and say, I do that. Or I see that happening outside in society, and that's okay. Because that deals precisely with the problem. And it does it in such a sophisticated way. I mean, James does not just say, practice what you preach. But he also says, I'm going to show you how. James does this very cleverly in three ways. The Christian life is more than just a, an intellectual assenting of some kind of beliefs. It's more than that. It, it means acting in the ways that inspire by and are consistent with those beliefs. You're inundating yourself with your beliefs. And it means worshiping in ways that actually have a chance of being translated into action. 
When I tell the kids at the altar, watch for the Holy Spirit to come and the candle moves. Some people think that's hokey. But that, for some of us, is a sign of the Holy Spirit being with us. He is here now, but we need sometimes a little reminder, don't we? Oh, we're just in an old gas station. That's our church, you know? But the Holy Spirit's here. He has guided us into this time. The second part that James does is there's, observable, there, there's, there's an observable pinch points where there's a disjunction in most of us between our faith and our practice and where it shows up. And that's the truth. That's the truth because the world tempts us too much and it creates these pinch points. And there's, you're going to see this more and more in times of persecution and trial. If you were going to be arrested today for being a Christian, if there was really a trial that was coming down that was going to convict you and kill you because you're a Christian, where would you be? Would you be hiding your faith? There's a real question. Every year, there's over 100,000 Christians that are executed in the world. 100,000 people every year because of what we believe. What if it was you? What if it was you? And then James gives us these clear benchmarks to show us what we're doing and when we're doing things right. And you could call them community busters. And James lists them this way, three things. These are three things that will kill you. First and foremost is our tongue. Think about it for a second. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will always, always, always hurt me. You may gaff it off, but it hurt. That's the truth of the matter. Our tongues can easily reveal a, dis a discrepancy between our faith and our practice, Protect particularly when we use it to talk about God's love in ways that display little love to our fellow human beings. There's a lot of truth to that. Second point he brings up. We can talk about the treating everyone equally, but when it comes to the practice, we so often, even in the church, show favoritism to somebody's rich than they are poor. That's the truth. We do that. I see that as we go out and, and, and being part of the community. When I go to funerals or when I go to weddings, they're always like, oh, Father, you sit up here at the head table. I don't want to sit at the head table. I'm okay with sitting in the back with, you know, the mother and father of the bride or the group. I'm okay with that. But we all have that feeling that, okay, a U.S. senator's in town, so he has to sit at the head table. We've got to go meet him. What if we were to say, oh, well, listen, you know, how the guy that runs the fruit stand, he's going to be down at the Epiphany Church. Let's all go down and meet him. Would you all? But if I said President Obama's going to be down at Epiphany Church tomorrow, let's go meet him. Which one sounds more appealing to you? Well, to some of you, neither. Howard. Howard sounds more appealing. <laughs> but, but you understand what I'm getting at. Is that we, too often as a people, we look at people's position a little bit more than we should. You work just as hard in your cubicle as the guy who has the sky to. It may be a different work that you do, but it's a work that makes a functioning company work, however the case may be. And the third part he brings up in this is that truth can be taught arrogantly or with humility. And this is fundamental to who we are as a church. The same truth, mind you, yet it becomes more true when it's taught from a person with humility and, dis and, and a desire for peace. And it seems less true when it's taught with arrogance. Did you ever notice that? How many of you have been in there with somebody that you want to get to church and you're like, well, they just don't get the idea. We've got to go back. You've got to come to church. You've got to do this. You've got to, you've got to, you've got this form up. And, 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 and it's true. They have to go to church or they have to do this. We have to quit drinking. Whatever the case may be. We can get up there with an arrogance and that's going to turn that person off. More than, hey, I love you. I've been down your road. Let me tell you what helped me. They got to open up and listen because you, you now earn the right to be heard with them. 
So that's what James is saying, that sometimes you may have the same story, but the way that you present it is going to be very, very different. Now, for some of you, I may be showing my age, but I remember one of the most fundamental things that happened to me was in 1990. And it happened on the 1st of January. And, you know, everybody's getting up and they're all like, oh, you know, what a great New Year's Eve, or bad, depending on what part of the country you're in or what party you went to. But I remember that Czechoslovakia had just become a free nation. And some of you may remember this. And, and, and there was this guy named Havel. He was a former communist. And he was elected by his uh, government, his newly elected government. And most of them were communists. But he was elected by them to take over and to be the president of Czechoslovakia. Now this is after 40 years, 40 years of Tito and the, and, the, and the, you remember he even changed the colors. We wouldn't be red, we'll be blue. You know, we're going we're gonna to be a different type of communism. But there was a, there was a totalitarianism. There was, there was a, a repression of the people. And, and so he's elected president by this <coughs> parliament of, that was dominated by Collins. And Howell said this. This was on New Year's Eve, 1990. He says, we lived in a contaminated moral environment. Sounds familiar. We learn not to believe in anything, to ignore each other, to care only for ourselves. Concepts such as love, friendship, compassion, humility, and forgiveness lost their depth and dimension. And for many of us, they came to represent only psychological peculiarities or to resemble long-lasting greetings from ancient times. How many times have you said, I love you to somebody, and all of a sudden it sort of becomes a habit. And you're like, oh, yeah, whatever that is. So what do I say this? He goes on to say, it would be quite unreasonable to understand the sad legacy of the last 40 years as something alien, something bequeathed to us by some distant relative. But on the contrary, we must accept this legacy as a sin that we have committed against ourselves. As the summer unfolds, as both myself and other preachers that are going to be in here, as we look at the book of James, we're going to start seeing the similarities to the Czech President Havel's speech and the book of James. James was living in a similar environment. He was being persecuted by Paul, or Saul at the time. He was being persecuted by Saul in the church. He is, we both are virtually interested in the creation of a true community. Havel and James wanted a true community. An era in which a sense of personal responsibility seems endangered, Havel calls it true, as does James. James is also unafraid to call sin by its true name. And like Havel, he will not allow us to shirk responsibility for our actions or the evil that occurs because of our inaction. There are different ideas as to who the author of this book is. I've heard some say that it's, it's another James or it's a tribute to him, but I, I believe it is the brother of Jesus Christ. But I, like most theologians, believe that it is put in there for a reason for us to learn. And especially as a new church, the book of James is foundational material. Not fundamental, foundational material. Are you only a Christian in here? What do you do when you get onto Highway 17? That's what James is saying. You have to be the same here as you are out there. You're going to have a few surprises in people who are going to be preaching. And I look forward to the summer with some of you that are going to be called forward by God to preach about how James, how you live your life, and how the book of James tells about that. We are on our way to a life of changing all of us. And after the visit, just like Paul, after that visit with Christ, these people are going to explain how their life has changed and how they put themselves second and God first. And where their eyes have been opened to new things that God has put before them and changed the way that they lived out their lives. The book of Tra James tries to be an owner's manual of sorts for a new Christian. And he must master 
at convicting, refining, and empowering. Those are your three key terms. Convicting, refining, and empowering. If you're not convicted, you haven't received the Holy Spirit yet. So I beg you this summer to keep up with either, if you're going to be off on vacation somewhere, uh, please keep up with the videos as we go through this. But the book of James is foundational material for us, and I see, I see this as being nothing but a good, good win situation, because he, James, is always going to talk about that we as Christians need to go to the cross. We as Christians need the cross. You cannot allow the cross to be anything other than our life savings in the end. That is what James is going to preach about. So pray for me as we go through this series. And prayerfully, you'll get something out of this that will change you and hopefully it will guide you into meeting the Holy Spirit. And prayerfully, you don't lose your eyesight with scales and have a few of us afterwards. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.